Namaste and welcome to Beyond Asana Yoga and Spirituality in the West. My name is Betsy and I am the host of this podcast. So today we are going to be talking about um, the history of the translations of the Yamas and the Niyamas from the Yoga Sutras. <clears throat> As someone on Instagram, Haley, um, asked, or suggested, I guess, that the Yamas and the Niyamas would be a good topic, so I decided to run with it. Also, pardon me, I am recovering from a cold, so my throat hurts. So I have some tea, so that's fun. I got some tea here in my cup. Hope you can see it. It says, you're my favorite. Because you're my favorite. Or, well, if you're watching us on YouTube, you can see it. But you are my favorite because you're so kind to come and listen to this podcast. I'm very grateful that you would take the time to listen to any of this podcast. I truly appreciate it. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> excuse me. So before... We get started. I would like to be cheesy and ask you to go beyond the podcast and come hang out with me over on Instagram at beyond.asana.podcast. Instagram, it's my favorite. Um, if you're more into Facebook, you can search for the page The Niamis Travel Project. Um, I'm trying to post more content there. Um, also, if you would like some extra content, you can check out the Patreon and have access to some more content there. So let's get into today's topic. All right, so I looked at a variety of sources for this, which you'll come to see. Um, the majority of the information about the pre-modern translations comes from a translation and commentary by Dr. Edwin F. Bryant. And it's fabulous. Full disclosure, I took a course with Dr. Bryant through yogic studies on bhakti yoga, so a different topic. Highly informative, though. Um, I took it live. However, you can still take the class as on demand if you want to go check it out at yogic studies. So that's the main source. However, I consult any number, well, there is a specific number, I guess, of other sources, uh, which I'll mention throughout the podcast, and I will list them in the show notes and um, description if you're watching this on YouTube. So, brilliant. Here we are. So, as I've said, today we're going to be discussing the Yamas and the Niyamas, that are found in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. However, before I get to the Yamas and Niyamas, I'm going to give you a brief background on Patanjali and the Yoga Sutras. So, the Yoga Sutras were written sometime between the 2nd century BCE and the 5th century CE. So, BCE, I don't mean to imply you don't know, but my college students oftentimes don't know. So BCE is before the Common Era and CE is the Common Era. And many scholars believe that multiple men attributed to the Yoga Sutras, although they're attributed to one individual. So what are the Sutras? What are Sutras in general? They are short aphorisms. For example, I'm going to attempt to read Sutra 
in Sanskrit. Tada, Rastu, Swarupe, Vastam. Eh? Very nice. So, um, all right. So, this sutra translates as then the seer, parentheses, self, abides in its own nature. And that's the translation by Swami Sachidananda. So, as you can see, this is a very short sentence. And with each sutra, whomever is writing a commentary on it, basically sort of translating that sutra for you, um, they vary in length depending on the commenter. Um, here, Sachidananda's translation or commentary on this particular sutra is one, two, three, four paragraphs long. So that's sort of how this tradition of sutras works. Somebody writes a text in sutras and others write commentaries. So this commentary by Sachidananda is a, you know, modern commentary. So my background is in art and art history, and I see the sutras from any tradition as functioning a lot like iconography in artworks. So that means that you're reading an artwork through an iconographical analysis, meaning that you're looking at the signs and symbols presented in the work of art to understand its meaning. So in a lot of ways, the commenters on sutras are doing the same thing. So if an artwork is from a different time and or place from your present time and place, you may need to do some research to know what the signs and symbols in the artwork mean. And the same is true for the sutras. So in the same way, there are several pre-modern commentaries or men who expound upon the sutras to make them more understand, understandable. Um, so in that same way, there have been many new commentaries in the modern period from which from scholars and yoga teachers. So either way, it is important to note that each of these authors is translating the yoga sutras through their own culture and place in time and space, right? So these commenters are like in the pre-modern period, especially they are translating it through the lens of, you know, what is popular in that moment in terms of a variety of traditions. And in, I would say, in the modern period, the translations, I mean, scholars especially, they're going to look at these pre-modern commentaries in order to generate their own commentaries. There are instances where new commentary adds sort of new features to certain things, again, based on the time and place that author is living in. And you know, it sort of gets culled down, like in the modern period, in our contemporary time, it gets sort of translated again to fit the modern lives of people today. So just keep that in mind whenever you're reading any historic or religious document, even if it's a translation, Things can be interpreted differently and in new ways. Important to keep an open mind. Now that doesn't mean that certain translations or commentaries should be completely disregarded or whatever, right? They can be helpful. So, scholars in particular have a variety of opinions on how much each um, commentary deviates from what 
Hattonjali's original meaning would have been. But we may never really know exactly what Patanjali was thinking, unless we find some notes, which we haven't yet. So furthermore, through this discussion, I will refer to some of these um, commentary writers. So the pre, um, and I'll point those out as I go through. And I will also tell you some of their commentary. Um, but like I believe I already mentioned, I was not able to get my hands on any, um, you know, sort of exact translations of these pre-modern commentaries. So what I have comes from Dr. Edward, or Edward, Edwin F. Bryant's book, The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, a new edition, translation, and commentary. And Bryant is a religious scholar and he teaches at Rutgers. Um, so I will also be referencing multiple contemporary commentaries on the work as well um, as conversations that I had with Nikolai Bachman during my yoga teacher training. And I had hoped to include some comments by Sunita Patel. Um, however, I couldn't find my notes. So I'm not going to put words in her mouth. So in addition to these sources, Dr. Bryant gives a wonderful lecture on this topic of the Yoga Sutras to the Vedanta Society of New York, which you can find on YouTube. It's about an hour and a half long. I had watched it several months ago. I watched it again like two days ago. Um, and as I mentioned, I did take a course with Bryant on Bhakti Yoga through Yogic Studies. And although this course was not about the Yoga Sutras, he did point out the philosophical and theological differences between the Yoga Sutras and Bhakti Yoga throughout the class. So that was also informative. So you may be sitting here, Betsy, oh, that's wonderful. What the heck are the Yamas and the Niyamas? Good question. So I'm going to give you the translations of what they are from five different commentaries, all of which come from the modern period, more specifically from the 20 and 21st centuries. So Swami Sachidananda translate the, translates the yamas as abstinence or regulation T.K. Desikachar says that the yamas are our attitudes towards our environment. Rambakht describes the yamas as things not to do. Kelly DiNardo and Amy Pierce Hayden wrote a um, commentary together and they translated the yamas as, a, as moral codes. And Alan Finger, another um, contemporary yoga instructor based in New York, says that the yamas is a way of deprogramming mental patterns. So we can see these are quite diverse. As for the niyamas, Sachidananda calls them observances or training. Desi Kachar translates the niyamas as our attitudes towards ourselves. Bakht calls them things to do. Denardo and Pierce Hayden describe them as observances. And Alan Finger says the niyamas are the act of reprogramming oneself for living in homeostasis. As for Bryant, he translates the yamas as, um, as abstentions and the niyamas as observances. Furthermore, in his academic commentary, he says that Shankara's commentary added that you were also supposed to practice dharma or righteous conduct and accept a guru or teacher, which I may come back to. Um, and getting into dharma and its original meaning is also interesting. Maybe I can do a short thing specifically on that. Perhaps I will put it on the YouTube. No, I'm not on the YouTube. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'll probably stick it on Instagram. I mean, I guess I could put it on YouTube also. So 
This first discussion of the yamas and the niyamas comes up in Sutra 2.29 that gives all eight limbs of Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga or eight-limbed yoga system. So all eight of the limbs are the yamas, the niyamas, asana or postures, pranayama, which is breath control, pratyahara, or withdrawal of the senses, dharana, or concentration, dhyana, which is meditation, and samadhi, which is absorption. So Sutra 2.30 tells us what the five yamas are. And here I have the way Satchidananda uh, tr translates them. So, Ahimsa is nonviolence. Satya is truthfulness. Asteya means refraining from stealing. Brahmacharya refers to celibacy. And apaha, no, no, that's not what that says. That says aparigraha, or refraining from acquisition or coveting. So as a side note, the yamas are also found, I mean, they're not called the yamas, but the same list is found in Jain texts, which makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm guessing most of you don't know that much about Jainism. My graduate professor, she studied medieval Jain architecture. So the first time I went to India, we were actually, or well, yes, we collectively were looking at Jain material and I was learning more about it. So. Um, this makes complete sense that you would find a list like this in Jain texts because they, in some ways, for lack of a better term, take some of these to an extreme, especially Ahimsa. So um, Jains do not eat root vegetables, for instance, and they don't, you know, they're vegetarian but they won't eat root vegetables because whenever you pull a carrot out of the ground, it is the root that we eat. So you're killing the plant. And some of the monks and nuns in their tradition will actually carry a broom with them and sweep their path so that they won't step on any bugs. They'll also actually wear a mask so that they don't accidentally breathe in any bugs. So, I get it. I get it. So these all seem pretty straightforward. Or so it would seem. However, you may be asking yourself, well, are there exceptions, right? Like ahimsa, nonviolence. We approach that in a very particular way today, right? <laughs> um, so From what I found, according to Pat and Jolly, the answer would be no, there's not exceptions. However, for the most part, also if you were following this eight-limbed system, and in Pat and Jolly's day, you might be an ascetic, meaning that you were living outside of society, which would make following some of these things perfectly a lot easier in my opinion. So let's go ahead and take a look at ahimsa or nonviolence, which is discussed in Sutra 2.35. So according to Patanjali and echoed by Vyasa, who was the very first commenter, the first person to write a commentary on the Yoga Sutras that we are aware of, they both say that ahimsa is the most important of the yamas. So Brian says, quote, Vyasa, accordingly takes ahimsa as the root of, of the other yamas, end quote. Brian goes on to say, quote, although ahimsa has been defined by Vyasa as not harming any creature anywhere, anytime, one must continue to perform one's dharma or duty, cautions Vishnana Bhak Su. That's not right. Vijnana Bhiksu. 
That might not be right either. Something like that. So even though it is impossible to avoid harming tiny living entities such as bacteria or insects when one engages in activities such as bathing or cleansing, nonetheless, one must strive as far as possible to avoid harming even an insect, end quote. So a later com uh, commentary by Hari Harananda goes on to say that one should avoid harming even trees. So you get a sense of like, okay, there are some things that are simply completely unavoidable, like washing any bacteria off of your skin. However, other things, if it is somehow avoidable, you should avoid it. So that's good. And don't harm the trees. I concur. So let's go ahead and move on to Sutra 2.36, which covers satya or truthfulness. So Desi Qatar translates the sutra as, quote, one who shows a high degree of right communication will not fail in his actions, end quote. He continues with his brief commentary to say, quote, the ability to be honest in communication with sensitivity without hurting others, without telling lies, and with the necessary reflection requires a very refined state of being. Such persons can, cannot make mistakes in their actions, end quote. So let's compare um, Desi Kachar's commentary, translation and commentary with um, Alan Finger's translation. Quote, when one gr is grounded in satya, that being, that being's intention manifests with grace and ease, end quote. So both of these say you will reach your goal easier if you are truthful. However, they divert in a way that encompasses, in the way they encompass the sutra. So Desi Kachar situates your actions more outwardly in dealing with others, while finger is, for, finger is focused more inward. But what is the goal? In the context of the Yoga Sutras, the goal you're working towards is Samadhi, right? You've got to always keep that in mind. Like, especially in modern commentaries, it seems like, I mean, I guess when you look at it in the entire context of the Sutras, that makes sense. But I feel like that also kind of gets lost as if, you know, that it's just also like the best way to live life, which arguably could be true, right? To be truthful, right? But I mean, well, with all the yamas and the niyamas, but you've got to keep in mind, like this is the purpose. It's not to be like, the purpose isn't to be a good person. The purpose of doing all this is to reach samadhi. So, Vyasa further defines truth or how you know something is true. So, Bryant states, quote, Vyasa defines truth, the second yama, as one's words and thoughts being an exact correspondence to fact, that is, to whatever is known through the three processes of knowledge accepted by the yoga school, end quote. So, these three processes of knowledge are perception, inference, and verbal testimony. So it's important to note that personal experiences should be prioritized above inferences and verbal testimony, right? If you have a personal experience with something, you should trust that mm -hmm. instead of going off of something written somewhere or even the comments of a trusted source, right? Which trusted sources, a lot could be said about that today, right? And, you know, can we even agree on what trusted sources are? So, furthermore, Vyasa continues, quote, 
Speech is for the transferal of one's knowledge to others and should not be deceitful, misleading, or devoid of value. So consider how much you say in a day that is meant to persuade someone one way or another or to manipulate someone into doing what you want them to do. And this goes against Patanjali's idea about truthfulness. So Vyasa, by extension, I would say Patanjali is saying, you know, that you should be transferring what you know is true, right? So that would include not spreading rumors. Maybe you, if it's a rumor, you probably, that doesn't that mean you're, you weren't there. You don't know for a fact that it's true. Um, so yeah, no spreading things like rumors. You don't want to be misleading to get yourself ahead or any of that stuff, right? You just want to tell the truth. However, that could also be within reason. Oh, Poodle just messed up the video. All right, so let's go ahead and proceed to Sutra 2.37. So here I've looked at Donardo and Pierce Hayden, Hayden's translation of uh, this sutra. And they say, quote, the practice of non-stealing ceases abundance and prosperity. These women are contemporary yoga instructors and own their own studios here in the United States. And so they give us a modern day example infused with Pat Jolly, which I'm gonna read it to you. Or I'm not. Am I crazy? I believe I am. Let me find it. I wrote down the wrong page number. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong book. <laughs> okay. So, Leonardo and um, Pierce Hayden they give us this sort of modern day example infused with Patanjali. So they say, it's hard not to like Tom Ripley, especially when played by a six pack rocking Matt Damon. He's charming, polite, hardworking, eager to please. He's also a con man, imposter and cold blooded murderer. In the talented Mr. Ripley, Tom is an orphaned piano tuner and washroom attendant who is mistaken by a wealthy businessman as a Princeton pal of his, of his romping through Italy's son. Did that make sense? So Tom is an orphaned piano tuner and washroom attendant who is mistaken by a wealthy businessman as the Princeton pal of his romping through Italy's son. The father hires Tom, who never corrects the mistake, to go to Europe and bring his son home. The adventure leads Tom to steal money, the son's identity, and eventually his life. Part of what makes Tom likable and easy to empathize with is that, as one critic put it, quote, he's deprived, not depraved, end quote. So people steal, studies show, because they feel deprived. When we feel deprived, we are trying to make it right, and that makes it easier to rationalize our behavior. It's easier to say, I need this, I deserve this. But Patanjali says the opposite is true. If we don't take what isn't ours, asteya, we will flourish. Classically, asteya is translated as non-stealing. And the sutra says, when we practice non-stealing, all wealth comes. On the surface, it means not taking money or things from someone and covers everything from holding up a bank to snagging a yogurt from the office fridge, to overbilling for work that you did. On a deeper level, it goes far beyond material objects. It takes ideas, love, attention, and time that isn't freely given. We steal from ourselves when we don't express our needs, 
and deprive ourselves of help. We rob others of their time when we're late to a meeting. We let our minds steal us away from the present moment, from the full experience. We feel deprived. We believe we're not good enough, that something is missing, so we take it from others. If we feel deprived, nothing comes. Abundance, when we have so much of something that we have no want or need for it, is the opposite of deprivation. When we look at how our lives are full instead of what they are lacking, when we believe we are enough and have enough, we have no need to steal. We recognize the fullness of our lives. We flourish and all wealth comes. So with this interpretation, I think Denardo and Pierce Hayden stay pretty true um, to pre-modern pre commentaries on the sutras. Bryant Bryant says that Bas ba Basha Bashaspati Misra explains, quote, since action is initiated in the mind, the more one desires something, the more inclined one becomes to acquire it, end quote. And Shankara states, quote, thoughts of stealing obviously cannot exist in those free of desire, end quote. Right? So if we feel like we have everything we need, we don't feel like we need to steal anything. My poor dog. She's trapped by all the cords running around. So let's move on to Sutra 2.38. Satchidananda translates this sutra like this. Quote, by one established, by one established in continence, vigor is gained. End quote. Now here we have a note that um, continence, oh, we have to make a note. I have to let y'all know that here, continence can mean and does mean exercising self-restraint, especially sexually. Not anything having to do with the bathroom. So in his commentary, he goes on to say, quote, by getting established in continent Continence or celibacy, we save energy. Virya means vital energy. Leba means profit. So when there is not loss of virya, we gain energy. And what we gain by this savings is worth knowing. In the name of loving and giving, many times we lose this energy and become mentally and physically deplete. If we are not strong mentally and physically, we can never gain real spiritual wealth, end quote. So Bryant shares that, quote, Vyasa defines celibacy as the control of the sexual organs. And this is defined by Vakaspati Misra as not seeing, speaking with, embracing, or otherwise interfering with members of the opposite sex as objects of desire, end quote. So Hari Harananda exp expounds upon this by saying, quote, that a frugal diet and moderate sleep are important for celibacy. Plenty of milk and butter may be sattvic for the ordinary person, but not for the yogi, end quote. So, um, Hari Harananda here is sort of saying if you eat a little less and maybe sleep four or five hours instead of six to eight, that'll make you less inclined to want to participate in sex. At least that's how I'm understanding it. So Brian goes on to say, quote, in short, ultimate self-realization cannot be attained if one is sexually active, because this indicates that one is still seeking fulfillment in this sensual level, and thus misidentifying with the non-self. So, while I was in yoga teacher training, we had several sessions with Nikolai Bachman, who wrote The Path of the Yoga Sutras. And we discussed Brahmacharya um, in terms of translating it 
for the modern world, for that in which we most of us are living, right? Um, and so we had this conversation and Bachman basically says that you should um, treat sex responsibly, right? And so, but this statement is even in the eye of the beholder, right? So on one hand, you could say, well, this means not having sex just for the fun of having sex. Um, and, you know, possibly only having sex within a committed relationship, um, of course, but that sticks to a certain, like, standard, right, of all this whatever, right? So, um, and obviously, he had no interest, and here I have no interest in um, shaming anyone for their sex life, what you want to do, that is your business. Um, so this is simply sort of what is put forth in the text. And honestly, if you're interested in more of my opinions or thoughts on sex, mainly as they relate, well, partially as they relate to everyone, but as they relate to me, and by to everyone, I really mean like sexual health and sexual knowledge, um, you can head on over to Patreon. There's some content over there having to do with um, the second part of the Neo-Tantra podcast. And if you didn't listen to that, you can go check that out because we talk about Neo-Tantra in terms of sex education, sex therapy today. So that's cool. All right, so Sutra 2.39. Desi Kachar translates Sutra 2.39 like this, quote, one who is not greedy is secure. He has time to think deeply. His understanding of himself is complete, end quote. So his commentary goes on to say, quote, the more we have, the more we need to take care of it, right? The more you own, the more you got to take care of. So the time and energy, energy spent on acquiring more things, protecting them, and worrying about them cannot be spent on, base, on the basic questions of life. So what is the limit to what we should possess? For what purpose? For whom and for how long? Death comes before we have had time to begin considering these questions, right? And I think this is especially true in the contemporary world that we're sitting in, right? It's like a buy, buy, buy fest, right? That's the point of capitalism. How much can you acquire? How many possessions can you have? And so in a lot of ways, in my humble opinion, the yoga sutra is really sort of really push against um, the way we live today. And, you know, that's fine. Ah, yes. So Finger says, quote, when one who is grounded in a parigraha, there arises a deep understanding of one's identity and purpose as one ceases to be attached to possessions and outcomes, end quote. And I think this is really um, key, at least key in my life, right? If you head on over to the Instagram and you look at some pictures, you watch my stories, you'll notice I have quite a few possessions. However, I mean, the longer I'm here, the more I get attached to them. But for a year and a half, two years, probably two years, I own very few possessions. Not so few that I could, you know, be an ascetic in the forest, but I didn't own, I owned a fraction of what I own now. And it was very sort of liberating. And when I first started um, possessing more objects again, because, well, I had moved back into my own apartment and I needed furniture and things, it was actually really like heavy. It was like, felt like a lot of responsibility. Um, and now I would like to, well, more than likely stick all this stuff in storage. I would like to leave again and uh, have less possessions. And by leave again, I mean, go back to India. I was living there for a year. I would like to go live there again. Anyway. So, 
I think all of this brings up very good questions. So Desi Kachar's commentary stays pretty close to what Vyasa writes. Bryant states, quote, Vyasa defines renunciation of possessions as the ability to see the problems caused by the acquisition, preservation, and the construction of things, since these only provoke attachment and injury, end quote. So Hariharananda goes on to say that there is trouble in acquiring objects in the first place. Then, once you've acquired them, they bring trouble again because you got to try to keep up with them. And you get distressed when you lose them. And I'm pretty sure we can all relate to this. You know, I get distressed when I lose my phone, when I'm walking out the door. And then I realize, oh, I'm holding it in my hand right next to my face because I'm talking to somebody on it, right? So, um, yeah, you know, complicated. So Bryant proceeds with um, Hariharananda's thoughts saying, quote, for such reasons, possessions produce some scars and these act activate in the future to cause distress in the form of hankering for objects or lamination for having lost them. Hoarding wealth without sharing it is sheer selfishness and points to a complete lack of sympathy for the plight of others." End quote. I can get down with Hari Harananda. So Bryant's interpretation of this is, quote, Yogi's attempt to give up all objects of enjoyment and take only what is required for their maintenance, end quote. Yeah. So here we'll go ahead and move on to Sutra 2.40. So with Sutra 2.40, the Yamas, the Yamas, ridiculous, the Yoga Sutras get into the specifics of the Niyamas, starting with Saucha or cleanliness. And I'm just now noticing here, as I'm looking at my script here, I didn't list these all out like I did the Yamas. How terrible of me. So um, there's Saucha, which is cleanliness, Tapas, which is austerities, Svadhyaya, which is self-study, and Ishvara Pranidhana, which is complicated and continues to get more complicated by the moment as I continue reading things. But we'll come back to that. All right, so let's look at saucha or cleanliness. Bryant translates the sutra quote by cleanliness, one develops distaste for one's body and the cessation of contact with others, end quote. And Desi Kachar translates it quote, when cleanliness is developed, it reveals what needs to be constantly maintained and what is eternally clean. What decays is external, what does not is deep within us, end quote. And Donardo Pierce Hayden translates it, quote, through purification, we naturally avoid toxic contact with others. So these three translations are somewhat different. And Bryant is probably the closest to the original context, at least in terms of Vyasa's commentary. So Vyasa says, quote, perceiving the defects of the body on one develops a distaste for it, keeps it clean and becomes self-controlled, end quote. So this goes back to helping with brahmacharya. So keeping the body clean will keep you from interacting with the bodies of others because you wouldn't know how clean they were. Thus, attraction to the opposite sex evaporates or attraction as we might say today, would just evaporate attraction to anyone. So Bryant goes on to say that in this sutra quote, Patanjali indicates 
that when one meditates on the state on the act of cleanliness and the reality of the body and its temporary and its temporary and skin deep beauty, one develops a distaste for it, and consequence consequently for sensual contact with other bodies. End quote. So Dusty Kachar translate translation at least keeps on track with the spiritual outcomes because Knowing what is eternal leads to the Atman and Samadhi. So Donardo and Pierce Hayden abandon the sexual content context altogether, equating cleanliness with a wider range of contexts, including the environment and relationships. And of course, this is much more palpable for today's world and sidesteps any discussion around, you know, sex in 21st century America and beyond, um, which is complex indeed, right? Nobody is going to go to their yoga class, right? At the local yoga studio, the yoga teacher, they're not going to go there and be like, hey, let's talk about these yoga sutras. I learned these in my yoga teacher training, and I would like to tell you how you should learn to find your body unclean so that it will make you not want to sleep with others. No one would ever come back. So there's that. <laughs> All right. So Sutra 2.41 just expounds upon Saucha. So um, I'm just going to read Satchidananda's translation of the Sutra, and we'll move on. He says, quote, Moreover, one gains purity of um, sattva, cheerfulness of mind, one-pointedness, mastery over the senses and fitness, for self-realization, end quote. So when your mind is not thinking about um, sex, I guess, you sort of gain this purity of sattva and you can have more cheerfulness of mind. It can be more one-pointed, um, which is helpful for meditation, which will lead you to samadhi. So, Sutra 2.42, and this one is about Santosha or contentment. It is my favorite. So, Satchitananda translates it as, quote, by contentment, supreme joy is gained, end quote. So, his commentary goes on to say, quote, as a result of contentment, one gains supreme joy. Here we should understand the difference between contentment and satisfaction. Contentment means just to be as we are without going out, going to outside things for our happiness. If something comes, we let it come. If not, it doesn't matter. Contentment means neither to like or dislike. End quote. So Alan Finger translates it, quote, When one is grounded in Santosha, one avoids struggling with one's challenges and circumstances. And this creates real ease in one's life, end quote. Now, within reason, 100%, 100%, within reason. Um, obviously, we live in a particular world, and here I'm making adjustments, you know, full understanding here, right? Like, if you don't have enough food to eat, I wouldn't say find contentment. So Bryant states that, quote, he also limits his comments here to quoting a verse that says, whatever happiness there may be in enjoyment of this world and whatever greater happiness there may be in the celestial world, they do not amount to one sixteenth of the happiness attained from the from the cessation of desires, end quote. So basically saying, if you don't have any desires, you're free of all these things, right? That will melt away all of your samsara and you're just sort of able to exist in this calm state. So Vishnana Vahiksu quotes the Tatreya Upanishad in his commentary saying that, quote, bliss of Brahma or bliss of Brahman or God is countless, 
times greater than that experienced by the most fortunate of embodied beings, end quote. And though I would love to expound upon this here, I'm not going to. But, um, but yes, being able to sort of abide in what is, as you can say, you know, feels nice, feels right. You know, we all have those moments where everything just feels right with the world, right? And you may be doing nothing. I often experience this while I'm driving in my car, like at a stoplight or something. It's kind of strange. So we all sort of experience this state, but there's a suggestion that we can make it last longer. So let's go ahead and look at Sutra 2.43, which talks about tapas or austerities. So Sachi Dananda translates it as, quote, by austerities, impurities of the body and senses are destroyed and occult powers are gained, end quote. Desi Kachar translates the sutra as, quote, the removal of impurities allows the body to function more efficiently, end quote. So Sachi Dananda goes on to explain, quote, the direct meaning of tapas is to burn. By the physical tapas of fasting, we burn our excess fat, away along with the toxins in our bodies. Oh, along with the toxins our bodies have accumulated. By mental tapas, we burn all of our old impressions. By verbal tapas, observing silence, we control speech. And when we burn, we feel some heat and pain. We undergo um, suffers. He or she is blessed because by that suffering, some impurities are purged out, end quote. So Bryant explains that in the Vedic Brahmana texts that, quote, tapas has been recognized as the vital form of predatory ascetic purification to be undertaken by the sponsor of the Vedic sacrifice and has remained a fundamental ingredient of Indic soteriological tradition. So... Soteriological means um, the doctrine of salvation. So um, what he's saying here is that instead of sort of burning the tapas yourselves, there is a Vedic um, sacrifice, purification, which I believe involves a fire not like a person going in the fire, but just like a ritual sort of burning in the same way a Catholic might say a certain number of Hail Marys, right? So you're sort of having a spiritual stand-in. I hope that doesn't come across as offensive. I don't mean it that way. Um, so Vyasa explains that practicing austerities destroys Thomas and Rajas. And through this, the Siddhas or mystical powers of the bodies, such as clairvoyance, which is perceiving things or events beyond normal sensory contact, and clairaudiences, which is hearing the soundless manifest. On the other hand, Bhoja Raja and Ramananda Sarasvati interpret impurities to mean the Kleshas, and Hariharananda took them to mean the limitations of the body, like hunger, thirst, and things like that. So, these tapas have been interpreted as a variety of things by these different pre-modern commenters, as well as modern commenters. So let's go ahead and look at Sutra 2.44 over Svadhyaya or self-study. Another personal favorite of mine. So Bryant translates Sutra 2.44 as, quote, from Study of scripture, a connection with one's deity of choice is established, end quote. I have some things 
I might like to say, but I'm not, I'm going to save it for later. Desi Kachar translates this sutra as, quote, study, when it is developed to the highest degree, brings one close to higher forces that promote understanding of the most complex, end quote. And Dinardo and Pierce Hayden translated as, quote, contemplation and self-study connect us to the inner divine. So I'm going to read from them again here. So, um, Donardo and Pierce Hayden write here in their commentary, Suzanne Bar Bargman, a Danish psychologist who always dreamed of belting out tunes like Whitney Houston. In her 40s, she decided to give it a go to try to improve her singing. She started using a karaoke program so she could hear what she sounded like. She eventually found a vocal co coach to give her feedback and guidance, and she committed to practicing an hour a day. After a year and a half, she made enough improvements that she started to write her own songs and train with other singers. She spent another six months reviewing her work before recording a few songs. Bargman practiced, reflected on her work, listened to external feedback, and adjusted her practice until she improved it to such a point that several of her songs got regular airplay on the pop stations in Denmark. She combined discipline, or tapas, and reflection, svedjaya, in order to make this happen. The moral of the story? Practice doesn't make perfect, but deliberate practice gets us to yogic perfection, which is living in our own full potential. Deliberate practice is more than simply repeating a task. It's adding a level of analysis and feedback so we can correct our path and continue to grow. It's not letting ourselves slip into autopilot. It's continually reflecting on whatever it is we're working to improve, whether it's singing like Whitney, remaining in pigeon pose, or building a new career. So I think this is an interesting contemporary take on this. I think I'm going to share it with my art students next semester. Um, yeah, because that sounds good. Um, so these are some contemporary takes. So Bryant explains that Svedyaya literally means self-study, but it more commonly refers to the study of sacred texts. And I've definitely um, heard this as a translation as well. So um, you're actually, by listening to this, you're practicing Svidiyaya right now because you're learning about the sacred text of the Yoga Sutra. Good job. So Bryant goes on to discuss some other possible connections with Vedic scripture that I'm not going to get into because it's very dense. And if you don't have some background in this knowledge, It'll make your brain hurt. Um, but Bryant concludes that Patanjali is both a yogi and an intellectual. So Bryant goes on in a discussion of Patanjali's beliefs around Ishvara or God. And I'm going to say this here because that will bring us to the next sutra. So, um, this will bring us to this last sutra. So the important takeaway from this discussion is that Patanjali points his reader towards a theistic view and thereby a God. However, the text does not have to be interpreted in this way, and it can be viewed through a secular or atheistic lens, which is actually how Alan Finger is translating it in his um, translation and commentary, which is, Tantra of the Yoga Sutras, essential wisdom for living with awareness and grace. And um, that's because not all tantric traditions, but the tantric, well, at least the non-dual Shaiva Tantra lineage of Tantra that is um, having sort of a renaissance, if you will, is... Um, doesn't believe in like a god 
in the sense of a bhakti yoga, a bhakti yogi, or um, a Christian or Jewish person or something like that. So this brings us to Sutra 2.45, the last of the niyamas, which is Isvara Pranidhana. So, Satchidananda translates this sutra as, quote, by total surrender to God, samadhi is attained. This being a theistic interpretation of the sutra. So, such, um, so however, we can look at Finger's translation to see a more secular or even atheistic view, as I mentioned. So, his reads, quote, when one is grounded in Ishvara Pranidhana, one is able to experience samadhi and live in synchronicity, with the universal consciousness. End quote. Yes, universal consciousness, the ultimate awareness, as my tantric teacher would say. So, thus, is Ishvara Pranidhana is required to attain samadhi, which could be read as rendering the other seven limbs of yoga as redundant. However, Bryant explains that in the commentaries of Bakaspati, Misra, and Ramanda Saraspati, quote, the other seven limbs of yoga help the yogi develop the requisite mental state that allows complete devotion to Ishvara, end quote. So, so, Vij, Vijnana Bahaiksu says, quote, One can say either that by mastering the other limbs of yoga, by grace of Ishvara, Samadhi is born, or that the other limbs bring about Samadhi by the grace of Ishvara, but do not have the powers themselves, end quote. And Boja Raja states, quote, That... Being success, that being success is attained in the way. No, that being success is attained in this way because Isvara, being pleased, removes the klesha's obstacle, the klesha obstacles, and awakens samadhi. How won't if I trip up once with what I'm saying? I trip up on the simple words. However, Ramananda Saraswati has a different interpretation. He says, quote, the devotion to Ishvara has a different object from yoga, the goal of which is the realization of Purusa, and thus can be considered to be an additional limb of yoga. Purusa is your inner light of awareness or consciousness. So, um, Ramananda Saraswati here is saying, no, the goal of yoga is not to connect you with your supreme deity or God. It's to connect you with your um, Purusa, which is your inner light of awareness or consciousness. So, Ramananda Saraswati goes on to reiterate, quote, that although one has an option, devotion to Ish Ishvara hastens the attainment of samadhi. If one lacks faith in Ishvara, samadhi remains remote. But if one's yoga but if one's yoga is permeated with the nectar of devotion, it is very near. End quote. So Bryant goes on about um, theology at this point, but one needs to broaden but one needs a broader understanding of Indi Indian religious traditions to under to really kind of understand. And this is not really the time for that conversation, as will go on for an eternity. And I don't feel like I know enough about the topic to get into it. So um, here I would like to share just a um, just for reference, a few discussions from two books that are purely about the yamas and niyamas. So one is the yamas 
and Niyamas Exploring Yoga's Ethical Practices by Deborah Adele. And the other is Yoga's Yamas and Niyamas 10 Principles for Peace and Purpose by Courtney Sieberling. They're on my Kindle. So one moment, please, while I open them. And of course, the Kindle wants to spaz out. So there's that. Does anybody else have that problem? A spaz Kindle? Oh, yes. And one is apparently... I don't want to try again later. Hello? McFly? Oh, dear. Oh, I think it's going to open. Oh, it's going to download. I'm not really sure why. My Kindle likes to just undownload the books from it. It's a real pain. Okay, so um, I'm going to read you what they say about Ishvara Prani Dana. Mm -hmm. So this is what Adele says. In the movie Dirty Rotten Scoundrel, Two con men find themselves in the same lucrative area. Realizing that there is room for only one of them, they make a wager, agreeing to pick an innocent woman and con her out of $50,000. The first one of them to succeed in obtaining the $50,000 will maintain sole rights to quote-unquote work the area. The other will leave, never to return. The wager unleashes a comical set of events in which each con man tries to outdo the other. But the real surprise comes at the end when it is the woman who swindles $50,000 from both of them. What is interesting to me here, or what is interesting to me are the reactions of these two men when they realize that all the time they have thought they were doing the con, in reality, they were being conned. In a fit of anger, one of the men reacts with what looks like a two-year-old tantrum. The other man, however, is very quiet and slowly begins to get a broad smile across his face. He then begins to laugh in delight at the mastery of this woman who has outsmarted him and walked off with his $50,000. There is a lesson for us here, I think. How often do we, like the men above, try to con life as if there was a prize waiting for us if we succeed? And when life doesn't do what we want, we throw a tantrum. Just think about how many times you tell yourself you had a bad day because it doesn't go the way you had planned. We can be so busy feeling cheated or victimized when life doesn't go the way we want it to that we often miss a new opportunity life is offering us in the moment. Ishvara Pranidhana, the jewel of surrender, presupposes that there is a divine force at work in our lives. Whether we call it God, grace, Providence or life, this force is greater than we are and cares deeply about us. Surrender invites us to be active participants in our life, totally present and fluid with each moment while appreciating the magnitude and mystery of what we are participating in. Ultimately, this guideline invites us to surrender our egos, open our hearts, and accept the higher purpose of our being. And she goes on to sort of expound a lot on this but I think you get the idea so let's look at what Sieberling says about Ishvara Pranidana so um, she translates it as wonder so the best moments in life are the simplest the ones we can't plan for. They include sunlight sorting its way through the branches of a tree, a symphony of wind, an impromptu game of peekaboo with a toddler, or a welcomed conversation with a stranger at a coffee shop. These moments don't happen unless we open ourselves to allow them to happen. We can easily sink into routines of walking with our heads down and our phones, down in our phones, and wonder why we feel unfulfilled or unseen. Life doesn't open to us unless we open to life, and life is not inherently meaningful. We must make it so, and we do this by choosing to see the world's magnificence. 
Ishvara Pranidhana, wonder, is the last of the niyamas and is celebrated and is a celebration of the spiritual. When we look for wonder around us and reveal it and re <laughs> when we look for wonder around us and revel in it, we awaken our spirit. Wonder is childlike, and this niyama is all about seeing the world in the way a child does, with curiosity and awe. We can build our wonder skills by noticing the beauty around us, the softness of a dog's fur, a cactus blooming, or the clear blue hue of the sky. Lighting a candle before yoga can make a practice feel more intentional. Starting the day with a meditation or poem can remind us of our beating heart. Taking a moment to look into the eyes of someone we love and tell them how important they are puts us in relationship with the divine. And so in a way, these two women take um, a little bit different approach, but, um, you know, are sort of looking for what life has to offer when we just let it, right? Which I guess goes back to these discussions, but you also see they broadened it far beyond a theistic translation, right? Because, again, both of these women are uh, trained yoga teachers. And if you're going into a yoga class, you don't want to make this barrier, right? Um, or most people don't want to make a barrier. If you are going to teach a spiritual practice or um, spiritual in terms of a specific lineage, you know, you probably want to say that up front so people can decide if they want to participate or not. Um, but I think this is very interesting. Like in the pre-modern texts, many of the uh, commentaries discuss Ishvara Pranidhana as like surrendering to God. Um, but these women are more just saying surrendering to life, surrendering to what is in that moment, which is sort of a mindfulness take on it, you could say. So I would love for you to let me know um, some takeaways that you had from this discussion. Um, how easy do you think it would um, be to put these observances and restraints into practice in your life, especially in the way Pat and Jolly sort of envisioned. Personally, I would think it would be fairly difficult. Um, some of them not so much, but some of them very difficult, or some of them difficult to constantly be doing, right? Um, so, does this at all make you wonder why this text is the premier text on yoga in the West? So I find this really interesting and actually um, in a conversation that I had through an Instagram live with Barbara Cortilis. I don't know that I'm pronouncing her last name exactly correct. Um, she's a yoga teacher in Australia. We were having a discussion about Nandul Shiva Tantra and she asked me um, if I knew why the Yoga Sutras were the preeminent text taught in yoga teacher training in the West. And I said, well, I have some ideas, but not like completely. And um, through this research, I actually came across another book, which I've almost finished. And so next week, I'm going to talk about that, how the Yoga Sutras came to sort of be the premier yoga text in the West. Although they're not about postural yoga, really at all, right? Um, just as a hint, the asanas, I don't know, the word asana only, there's only like one, three sutras about asana in the entire text, and they purely refer to primarily seated texts from which you can do meditations. They don't, the yoga sutra is not talking about bhujangasana or you know, the sun salutations or anything like that. So, um, 
Surya Namaskar. So it's really interesting. And I found a book that basically is a historiography of the life of, well, the life of the Yoga Sutras and its translations, which is pretty interesting and diverts into many topics for which we can make a podcast about. So next week I will be discussing that um, the historiography of the Yoga Sutras. So the history of the Yoga Sutras is what I'm saying. So that'll be really cool. So I hope you come back and join me for that discussion. I thank you so much for joining me for this discussion. I hope it was informative and you got a lot out of it and learned some new things about some of the yamas and niyamas that you didn't already know and got some sort of historical context for them. And so I would like to say once again, thank you so much for joining me. It means the world to me. And I will leave you with Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. May peace be with you throughout the rest of your day and throughout the rest of your week. Have a good one. And we will talk to you and hopefully see you soon. Bye.